Hello, 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 and welcome back to the Sovereign Society podcast. Let me just say how incredibly excited I am to be sharing this conversation and to really witness what comes through because I have Bess Matassa here. And you know what's really exciting is that there's so many more people that are infusing mysticism and these ancient texts and experiences like astrology and tarot and really bringing a modern twist to it and it's something I just really respect because I think so much of our generation is about like paying homage to what was but also really being aware of the times and the now and the times and the now is about like it's not even about like balancing the two worlds but it's like balancing the two worlds in a way of how do we navigate through the tech and the changes but also keep our feet on the ground with what has been and these ancient wisdom the ancient wisdom and the texts and um, teachings that have been part of our ancestral um, upbringing in a way because it's a lot of these are old ancient texts but there's also so many shifts and before we pushed record Bess and I were talking about how how many of us like really started having that shift in 2012 and I was thinking last night when I was tossing and turning I was like you know what 2012 like we were so conditioned to be the doom and the gloom of the end of the world but what I saw was was the end of the illusion and it's, it's been the end of the illusion of the conditioning and the playing small and ancestral karma if you choose to go to the depth of your soul and really go there, have the courage, have the faith and the strength to really go outside of the quote unquote norm. So I'm really excited to dive in. Uh, and this conversation with you today, Bess, and I just really appreciate you being here. Thank you, Sabrina. Excited to chat and undo some ancestral karma, lay yeah. some new groundwork. <laughs> no big been, deal. Yeah. yeah, I mean, to me, that's like what fueled me in 2012. Like I was, you know, I've I was I've been writing my book and sharing my story, but like what really fueled me in 2012 and. I think it's amazing because like reading your notes, like you're a Southern Italian sister, as am I. Like mm -hmm. my I'm my mom is a first generation American and I was raised by my immigrant grandparents. My nonno -no -no came from Taranto, which is southern Italy, not Sicily, but we're at the curve of the boot. Yeah. And uh my my grandmother's sister, she was a witch, you know, and a doula. But I think, you know, as we've adapted into this Western American culture as well and bringing in these old ancient, uh, you know, like I said, teachings and wisdoms and ways of being, I'm, I know like I'm clearing this out for me, but also for my children to come. And that's what really fuels me to embark on my spiritual journey. So to go there, I would love to hear what fueled you to really be aware of your upbringing and your lineage and like paying homage to your ancestral line and teachings and wisdom while also bridging the gap to the now and being in integrity with who you are yeah yeah when i was a little babe i was pretty disconnected from any sense of that and continued to be, I mean, through a variety of complication around my particular family of origin story and being disconnected from parts of that. Um, but I think for me, astrology very early on, it was a language when I was, you know, eight, nine, 10 years old that I was seeking out books at the library. I had my card, you know, my tarot card deck. And for me, it felt like a return to a kind of immediacy of magic. And when you're talking about this sort of collision between the material and the modern sort of mystical world, um, it really feels like for me, 
astrology is a recovery process of kind of coming into that immediacy. It's just built on the four elements. And like these elements are in everything that surrounds us. And so, you know, although there's been a lot of complication around how astrology has sort of been abstracted as a tool, you know, used kind of pseudoscientifically or used by, you know, certain people trying to sort of protect the knowledge around it, at its core, it feels like, you know, for ancestral recovery, for all kinds of recovery of kind of core self, like one of the most beautiful tools to me, because it's really about the enhancement of the relationship we have with the immediate physical reality that surrounds us. And then using that as a gateway to all of these un unseen aspects of our being. And speaking to 2012, I can, I can only say that crossing from 2012 into 2013, I had a complete psychological breakdown. I nearly left out, you know, left the planet entirely and recovering the language again of astrology and tarot on a deeper level, starting to do it professionally was quite literally my lifeline at that time in terms of understanding my place in both ancestral lineage and a larger lineage of what it means to be a human and try to live on this planet as best, as best we can, basically. Preach. I hear you. I mean, like, I, I think I feel those of us who are really here to be golden age leaders who are here to really pave the path and live out our soul mission like I said the ones that have had the courage to answer the call and I saw this meme it was like if you are like when you are here to answer the call and people don't understand it wasn't a conference call right like <laughs> it was it was a call that was brought to you it was like an an individual call between you god spirit universe whatever lexicon you want to use on like why you came here during this time and it's really important again to like not discredit the lineage or your past or your childhood. But I think the biggest piece is like, how do you start to put the pieces together? Like you said, you were a young girl going to the library, studying astrology and like really starting to take inventory in a way of like, what are the things that sparked joy for you at a young age? What were the things that like, felt in alignment to dive in deeper with at a younger age what challenges were you able to overcome and shifting and alchemizing that mindset from being a victim to being victorious of what was and I think there's there's it takes like time away and time to shut out the noise of the outside world to get really quiet and honed in and really like really go in and I mean I'm so I'm so curious to hear too because I know like you got your doctorate in urban geography what fueled you like <laughs> wow what that all about <laughs> yeah like how like when you were getting that doctorate in urban geography like I'm just like so blown away like did you have like that knowledge of astrology before was that what had you or fueled you to want to get this this doctorate become a have a phd in urban geography and then use that to bleed into your work as an astrologer like i'm so curious about what you were hearing when you're like hey i'm gonna get my phd in urban geography yeah. and I'm going to run with yeah. this. Yeah. So as like a fire sign stellium, I have like, I don't really have a lot of foresight often. It's, it's more like sort of a visceral feeling. And then I go, you know, and like, you know, I've got four out of five of my, my personal planets in Aries and a moon in Leo. And so when I was hearing the call toward urban cultural geography, it was pretty much like, I was in a seminar hearing this kind of like modality and way of interpreting the world for the first time. I think it was um, toward the end of like my undergrad. And I was like, oh my God, this is the thing. This is like how I've always experienced the world, you know? And then I went out and worked for a while. And then I was like, kept getting called back to this language and ended up just doing this, not really thinking I was going to be an academic per se, but just like fascinated by this language and wanting to kind of dive in. And for me, it had a lot of parallels to astrology because mm. the kind of geography I studied was all about 
how people infused landscapes with poetic meaning and how the landscapes sort of then loved them back in this kind of reciprocal exchange between what's inside of us and emotions and the physical, you know, outside world and the metaphorical overlay for that. And so it felt very much in line with how I experienced astrology when I was a kid, which was as, as this kind of like heightened poetic awareness of like, oh my God, all of these living things are infused with like fire, earth, air, water, and these 12 sign archetypes. And you can kind of go into the landscape and say, ooh, that building or that tree looks like a Taurus. You know, this kind of surfacing over here feels, you know, a little bit textural, like a, you know, Capricorn kind of um, challenge or whatever the thing was. And so it seemed quite aligned to that. And then, you know, on the other side of that, right after I finished up the doctorate, I had a, my complete mental breakdown um, and, and was led back to astrology. And so in the early days, you know, I was adjuncting, I was continued to sort of have a foot in the academic world, but I was also offering readings and I was hybridizing the two. So my first offering was something called street signs, which took people to areas of New York that I thought would help them connect to the energy of their chart. And we sort of worked through the landscape and worked through their inner landscape. And then that started to sort of like mushroom into all these material mystical collaborations with, you know, a fragrance maker or a chef or, you know, all of these modalities for sort of inviting um, the sign archetypes and the planetary archetypes into our lives. So yeah, it was a, it was a strange journey, but one that actually made a lot of sense to me internally, at least at the time. I love that. Like, were you talking when you were writing your papers about the astrology and the landscape piece because if I was your professor I would have been like this is so brilliant this is <laughs> I'm sure very like engaging in a way versus all these other papers like were you writing about that then I wasn't writing about astrology in my dissertation my dissertation was about um walking and public space in New York and sort of these narratives of walking in the late 70s during New York's like fiscal crisis sort of disco era and how people were thinking about space and who it belonged to. Um, but I was also like, when I wasn't working on that, I was like giving readings for friends and like, you know, all of these kinds of other excavations. So I think the mystical was very much like part of the unseen footnotes of my research, but it wasn't explicitly present. But I really, I tried to stretch academia to the limits that poetics would allow it. Um, I think, you know, maybe if I would, be entering the program now, there'd be even more buoyancy to kind of use that language. But um, yeah, it was definitely informing the behind the scenes um, ethos for sure. It was definitely breadcrumbs of like the bigger, the bigger why of what you're doing here. I think that's so amazing. I just, I'm really always fascinated to hear the journey that people embark on and what calls them and just to really recognize or to hear uh, because I remember I was just teaching at uh, my the university I went to school with uh, last week, and I was sharing my story about like systems and podcasting to my internet marketing professor's class. He like texted me SOS, can you teach last minute like two classes tomorrow? And I'm like, <laughs> okay, I got this. So I was taught to his his classes about podcasting and the importance of authenticity. And, you know, I, I, I do believe that golden age success and the true key of success in today's day and world is if you can give yourself permission to be authentically you in the work that you do and how you present yourself and how you really show up. And I remember a lot of them were like, is this a stepping stone for like the, like what else you want to do? Or do you see yourself doing this for the rest of your life? I was like, I don't want to be doing coaching and stuff for the rest of my life. Like I'm writing two books right now. Like I was invited to go teach at the UN, but then COVID happened. Like I have bigger things, but I think that's what we need to understand too, is like sometimes we're, where we have these like little spot, like these spots or these checkpoints on our path. And there's a bigger unfoldment that can happen. And it's really important to just trust the journey and to trust that, you know, there's nuggets of wisdom that you are going to learn from every choice you make. So you even choosing to get your doctorate in that and then having, you know, like sounds to me kind of like a dark night of the soul of like reevaluating everything and what am I doing with my life? Like there was still, I'm sure, 
lessons you learned from that that you're even applying today into astrology and these archetypes, especially when you're talking about like the inner landscape versus the external. And so there there was pieces and that's when we were ta- like I was sharing in the beginning, like we can see like what's going on, but how do we refine it or realign ourselves or come into a, a union with that piece so that we can answer like a bigger calling? Yeah, it's interesting. When you were talking, I was thinking about it and, you know, I think it's perhaps specific to me and my journey, but for me, I feel like in some ways my whole life has been like a growing smaller. And I don't mean growing smaller in a way of like powerlessness or like not being my true self, but it's almost like being so steeped in myself that I can kind of like slowly back out of the room and like let things just come through as they want to come through. It's almost like an animal that's like so much its own spots that it becomes like camouflaged in the jungle, like trusting in that essential core and that through thread that just sort of remains. So I can kind of let the world do its work on me, not out of a sense of powerlessness, but a sense of like partnering with the currents that want to come through and showing up in a way that's not, um, I don't know, that doesn't, I don't know, feel like it's, it's this kind of willpower act or this fight between like what's inside and the external world and what's going to happen, but more this kind of hollowing out of the vessel that feels like I'm still able to be authentically me and flavor things. It's like things coming through are always going to be flavored, like best Matassa flavored, but I don't have to like strong arm them to have them have my signature on them. So that, this kind of like almost like getting a little buffed, you know, by, mm. by life as I've gotten older and older and being, um, I don't know, for my creative journey, it's felt like a relaxing kind of into a you know, for, to put it in astrological terms, I have a ton of planets in my sixth house, which is ruled by Virgo. And it feels very Virgo. And it feels like a learning of a Virgo and like letting it come through and being so, you know, gaining enough trust in the essential core of the self that we can let ourselves be kind of seasoned by it and season it. Beautiful. And that takes, that takes having the courage to get to know you better, like trusting you, trusting, like I said, God, spirit, universe, whatever term you want to use. And I know that's been a lot of my journey. I'm a one degree Virgo moon. So like with my chart and I have such strong Mercurian energy, like I want to communicate out into the world, like who I am, like that's my drive is like really communicate it and do it with conviction in a way and making sure that like it has like like drive and it's really there to make an impact but I really loved when you said allowing things to come through with trust and I think it takes time to um especially like if you you have to understand like the inner child within you have to understand like I said in the past like before and we started this conversation like the the checkpoints or the pieces of your past, like these memories and understanding like there's nuggets of wisdom that are there that are going to help you and support you and knowing and having faith that like you're never going to be steered off course when you allow yourself to trust yourself, you trust God, you trust your heart and you can be in this space of surrender. And I, I again, that takes, it takes courage to get out of your own way. And I mean, I I just think a lot of us, and I think that's been kind of the blessing of the pandemic and the shutdown. It was like, it just felt like a universal reset. And from that reset, I know for me, there was a lot of reevaluating and reassessing. And I think now that we have modern technology where we can communicate all pieces of the world we can share our wisdom we can share our truth we can share our stories and we can recognize that we're not alone in this too i think that can also bring in more trust uh with the outside world if we allow it but also Mm -hmm. having discernment as well i think that's a key piece as well I have some Virgo discernment. I am so, I don't know if you know, Sabrina, but I am so obsessed with 
the Virgo archetype. It's probably like, I'm like a total Virgo fangirl and I don't have any like planets in Virgo or anything. And I'm so obsessed that a few years ago I was approached to write a couple of books in sort of a sign by sign astrology series. And the first one I chose was Virgo. Cause I was like, no one else is going to write the Virgo. I've got to write the Virgo book. I've got to like <laughs> do some service and help like reposition the narrative around Virgo. Cause I feel like it's such complex alchemical energy that like refuses to be soundbited. And every time we hear it treated in a soundbite or a meme or whatever, I just like, I don't know. I get so up in arms about the Virgo cause because it's like that critical turning point. It's the sixth sign out of the 12 where we have to figure out what's the limit of the self. How do we kind of show up and enter the world and while keeping the self intact? And it's like, my God, there's like nothing more exciting in the whole astrological journey, I think, than that step out of the self, out of Leo and into the great wide world of the next six signs. So, yeah, I mean, and it's definitely, I feel like it's super misunderstood and for sure. And they're like, Oh, they're just like crazy OCD, but it's like, no, I, the way that I see Virgo and being a Virgo moon is like, I came here on mission and I just have to, st- I'm choosing to stay focused on like, my divine mission why it was brought here and there can be outside noise or like um people like trying to protect me or like they'll project onto me or you know they'll there's in a ways like they're projecting their doubts of like what I know is can be possible <laughs> what I've yeah. seen and I just have to continue I know like I said as a as a one degree Virgo moon like I'm I'm choosing to continue just to stay the course and stay focused and stay in alignment with where my faith lies and like the visions that I've had and it can it can be it can it's definitely like the road less traveled you know yeah. and I think a lot of us have been reliant on other people's opinions for a long time I think it's a huge part of the conditioning of like and I think because we, a lot of us, a majority of us really grew up with a lot of insecurity. And so there's a lot of that, that seeking or needing of external validation. And again, when you have the courage to do that deeper work, when you have the courage to dismantle the layers ancestrally from your inner child, from societal conditioning, um, and you're, you give yourself permission to purge all of that out, and then infuse that space with like your own self-love you can really come into that space of wholeness and I like to say like you become really unfuckwithable because you are embodied in your sovereignty and that's the driving force behind my medicine the driving force behind this podcast and again just like paving my own path (laughs) And some people may not understand, and that's okay. Everyone's doing their best based on their level of awareness. But we just have to continue to trust that the the path and the journey that we're we're embarking on, like there's purpose to it if you allow yourself to lead with heart. And when you talk about leading with heart and ancestral healing and all of this, it feels like in so many ways using astrology, like the gateway of the moon sign is incredible, an incredible tool for this because the moon sign, I mean, there's so many different layers to your moon sign, but you know, one layer is kind of the emotional core. It's almost like the kid or the presence that really yearns and needs and longs for and needs to be kind of attended before we get on with the rest of the work or the chart. So it's like, if you're not attending to the moon sign, you better believe it's going to be making some fucking noise in the back seat and like creating fumes <laughs> in the life, you know? So it's like in attending to that little kid in the back seat, then there's this layer of the moon that's the pole of like the tidal pole of the past. And so a lot of times the moon sign can be something that comes through family charts or that's about family or ancestral work that we're you know here in this in- incarnation to do. And it can be super interesting to look at charts of you know people generations back from you and see how they might have used the energy of the sign that you have as your moon sign and you know how you're using it in this lifetime and i don't know there's something really interesting there i think to use the moon sign as a tool and of course you know in western well not of course but it's been the unfortunate reality i think that the thing that's gotten the most airtime in western astrology historically has been the sun sign which is all about 
the hustle or whatever you want to call it, or the drive or the force of the individual, where the moon is this much more primitive pole of kind of the collective and the emotional pool of the inner self and all of that. So it could be, you know, kind of a cool thing for listeners to play with if you're just starting to work with astrology, you know, looking at your moon sign as this kind of gateway, like you've, you know, been working your one degree Virgo moon in order to, you know, heal lineage and also, you know, show up in this lifetime and, you know, be cogent and authentic and coherent as a soul. Yeah, that was really beautiful. I think it's really cool how many more people are diving in deeper to their signs. You know, there's, it's, it's yeah. definitely, I don't see it's as it's tab as taboo as it was before. Like people are more aware of their rising signs and their moon signs and even their Chiron and yeah people love know. Chiron <laughs> <laughs> everybody loves some Chiron work yeah, yeah. and uh, I mean I just think it's really great but I'm also like it's it's interesting because you know I know a lot of friends who are also working more with um sidereal astrology too and aren't just focusing yeah. so much on you know they're 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 thinking outside the box as well and it's interesting because anytime I use like a star map, you know, where you can like put in the sky and you can see where planets are. It's always showing that like the sun is in the, like it's showing more of the sidereal charts than right. it is more of how we've seen Western astrology. So I would love your take on like, cause a lot of people are saying that like, I'm seeing more and more people, especially like one of my best friends, um, Krista Ryerson, she's doing golden age astrology. She's working more with sidereal and seeing how, these, these signs are actually evolving, you know what I mean? And yeah. it's really interesting to see how I think with more awareness and again, like the shift into a new millennia, the shift like into a new age. Um, I'm curious as an astrologer, what you see of these different tropical sidereal and you know, how can we understand the two or what do we see as the major difference between them? Yeah, so I'm definitely not an expert in sidereal astrology by any means. Um, but I will say that that sort of writ large, the separation between the two systems has to do with what exactly what you're identifying, the constellations and where things are exactly in the sky versus Western astrology or what we call tropical astrology sort of branching off as more symbolic connected to the seasons, mm -hmm. you know, and so they're aligned with, you know, like, Capricorn season happens at this time of year and the, you know, the spring equinox and the, the winter solstice and so on. And so, you know, historically we've seen, and I can't speak to how sidereal astrology is applied because I know very little about it, but, you know, tropical astrology has come into the realm of sort of having this lineage now of like psychological astrology and symbolic astrology that kind of aligns with the outer landscape of the natural world. So it's like, if we're in the Western hemisphere, and it's, we're entering into Capricorn season. If we're in New York city, we have like ice rain flying at our face and like things are, you know, things are a little brittle. Things are a little challenging. We're asked to build endurance. So it kind of sort of relates to the symbolic principles of that sign. And, um, and I think that there's in the little that I've sort of played around with the sidereal, like when I was first years ago, when I first like, you know, looked at my sidereal chart, I was like, no fucking way. Like, am I like a quadruple Pisces? Like in what world? And then when I started to kind of like dive into it a little bit more, I was like, wow, this is really interesting because in, you know, and it's basically, I think at this point, it's like, you can kind of roll back each of your signs. I think it's 24 degrees and that will align you with what the sign is in sidereal. So it's like, if you're you know, at 26 degrees Aries in Western, you know, you're, well, that's a bad example, but if you're at, you know, 20 degrees Aries, then you're rolled back into Pisces from that planet. Um, but I was like, wow, this is really interesting because in my Western chart, I've got literally no water, not a drop to drink anywhere to be found. And in the sidereal chart, I'm entirely water. And it was like, there was something actually really kind of comforting about that on another soul level of being like, wow, like I actually really need and want a, like a metaphorical drink of water and to be moving toward this understanding of this element because all of us, and this is not at all to discount the specificity of you because I think astrology is this beautiful gateway to your birth chart and your signs and your degrees and all of this. But there also becomes a point where again, we're so steeped in ourselves that then we're like, 
this is a system of 12 archetypes, 12 sign archetypes. We all have all of them inside of us. We're all reaching to equilibrate. And so, you know, and it's like when I do readings these days, I'm like, I don't know, I'm totally like off chart sometimes. You know, I look at the chart and then I'm like some jazz musician or whatever. That's maybe not the comparison, but I'm just like, what does this person need in this moment? They may not be presenting with any Capricorn planets or Saturn transits, but all I can see is Capricorn when I look at them, when I look at their chart. And so it's like being steeped enough in the personal to then open up and say, wow, not that it's it renders it meaningless, but it actually renders it deeply meaningful to be able to go to this cabinet of 12 sign archetypes in these planets and say, what's needed right now? Just the same way you'd pull a card from a tarot deck and be like, oh, the high priestess, there they are, you know? And so I think this kind of like the debate between sidereal and tropical, not that, not that it's a real debate, but it's just like, we can use all of it. Like read your sidereal chart, read your tropical chart, you know, go wild and steep yourself so deeply in these archetypes that you can just wake up one morning and be like, damn, I just need some Gemini energy right now. I don't know where it's going to come from, but it's not on my chart, but we're going to go get it. And so I think that can be, can be a really interesting gateway to um, hybridizing and playing with these symbols in a different way. I love that. And I feel like in a way it brings more inclusion as well. You know, I think there's so much, the, yes, the diversity is great in terms of like, we have like this beautiful picture painted of like so much difference, but there's also this type of, uh, and I didn't, shouldn't even say div, uh, diversity, but I should say division, but there's this opportunity of of understanding the the pieces and the wholeness like there's no accident why both of these different um these different ways of reading astrology are here and like I said the fact that you were saying that there would be like so many more Pisces with that water and you were talking earlier about like emotions and the inner landscape versus uh the external in that way so I I, I do think it's really amazing when you have the time uh, to dive in deeper and maybe it's a way to like test an ego as well like your personal ego of like oh totally you know what I mean? my my leo <laughs> moon my leo moon becomes a cancer moon in sidereal and i was like ah! i was like so enraged just like there's no way and it's like that's really interesting information you know because cancer in my western chart is intercepted it's not even on a house cusp you know and so i'm like and I have a very strong, talk about ancestral healing, I have a very strong ancestral lineage around cancer energy, but it doesn't mm. show up in my Western chart. And that's really interesting information too, because I have historically really railed against that archetype. And so, so here it is, right on time. Yeah, yeah so I definitely think uh, it's, a, it's a total ego check because... <laughs> <laughs> you think you're gonna be like this because yeah I mean it would say for me that I'm more Taurus um, right. based you know with my son and I'm like oh I can I definitely see like I'm very like mercurial but I can be very stubborn like I definitely have that awareness and very like ground to earth down to earth and like grounded in earth but yeah I, it's very interesting in that sense as well so I like I said I'm always curious just to to keep to read and to take what resonates and really release the rest yeah. and also understand like is what's resonating with my ego or can I really dive in deeper and find like what's resonating as like my soul um, yeah so I think that's definitely an interesting piece as well yeah totally but now like I want to dive in a little deeper because I know you like you talked about earlier you have a book where you've done like your two books you did it all what Virgo and Leo right like your different signs yeah Correct? Virgo and Leo came out a couple of years ago and then before that I collaborated um with Ruby Ruby Warrington of the Numinous and we did an astrology deck which is kind I of like a teaching deck. tool with yeah with all the signs and the planets and all of that so yeah this is the fourth the the Numinous Cosmic Year, which is the book that's um, that's out now, is the fourth. And I'm just like, I don't know, as a lifelong writer and like having worked for so long in like the digital space, it's just really nice to like hold objects, you know, and just like hold them to your chest and really like, I don't know, there's something and especially like it speaks to me about the I think we're getting to a little bit of a saturation point with astrology of this kind of like um, what's the moon in now and what's what, what are we doing and what you know today and this day and this, all of this versus kind of this like larger rhythm of evergreen like okay we're in Capricorn season what's the feel 
we're in this season and using these symbols as kind of like a larger apparatus to then not have to like freak out about the minute of the hour of the day when, you know, Jupiter's going to whatever. Um, and so it's nice, I think, to have things in book form like that way too, because it feels like a little less tweaky and a little less like, you know, for so many years I was writing like so much horoscope content and I love horoscopes. I love it. It's this beautiful gateway, uh, you know, the first interface a lot of people have with astrology, but then it was like, you don't really go back and read your, you know, it's just like dumped into a hole. You don't go back and read your horse. I mean, maybe some people do, but yeah. So it's nice. Hopefully the book provides kind of both things. It has, you know, little tips and tidbits about 2022 specifically. And it also introduces readers to these seasons and these kind of larger energies of the months of the year. I love that. And I'm, I mean, this is going to be a really interesting year, 2022. The fact that we've got two, <laughs> two, two and in tarot that six is a year of the lovers and yeah i like i said i just i know for me and my journey with 2021 being so much of the hierophant and like me having to really dive in deep within myself and like heal that taurus energy getting like radically yeah. honest and like grounded in who i am and now we're going into you know here 222 gemini the lovers and again i think there's a lot of that self-love that's been really um on the forefront and we see it in um social media we're seeing like body positivity trends we're seeing more people like acknowledge their mental health we're seeing like more of this self-love really being uh the forefront you know what i mean and i think it's really beautiful to see so many people like and I, I'm speaking for myself included, that have been really devoted to filling up their cup so that they can share from this overflow. So I'm curious to hear, and in even February, February, well, we're going to have a 22222, you know, or a 2222 <laughs> is going to be... Oh, yeah. There's going <laughs> to be lots chill. of twos going on. So I'm curious yeah. to hear, like, what are the bigger ones that the bigger, like, uh, transits or times of year in 2022 that you think are going to be the most beneficial for peace and love and understanding and union of self and maybe union as a collective? Yeah, I mean, I think the entirety of the year is really an invitation around this kind of reunification. And it's really interesting because you're speaking to the numerology, which, you know, I'm, you know, I use tarot as equally, you know, alongside astrology, and there's lots of interplay between the two. And it's interesting because we're flipping into a six year, the lover's Gemini from a five year Taurus Hierophant. And, and also the nodal axis is shifting the other way. So we're shifting in astrology from the nodal axis being in Gemini Sagittarius to Taurus Scorpio. And so we're in this like really interesting dance around both Gemini and Taurus. That's really going to be an overlay for the entirety of the year. And I think you know, in terms of a tool or something to kind of think about energetically for the course of the year is really like what you're saying about this kind of like almost the Hierophant work for me and Taurus work is about like, what have I absorbed? It's almost like this sounds maybe kind of gross, but it's like taking an x-ray of like your, your metaphorical stomach and being like, what's in there? Like, what did I eat? Like metaphorically speaking, what beliefs did I swallow? What things are sort of stored in the density of me that then I, you know, I'm, I'm being called to sort of like inquire about like, oh my God, I didn't realize that like little P was swallowed, you know, 20 years ago that told me X, Y, Z about my worthiness or whatever the thing is. And then Gemini lover's energy, once we've excavated that, once we've looked at the internal layering and the contents and the absorption, then we go out into the world and we're able to take in and out easily. You know, Gemini is the breath. Gemini is sort of the act of respiration, the act of exchange. And so the lover's exchange becomes liberated in the sense of feeling like, okay, I don't have to like police the boundaries anymore, or figure out what the contents are. Like I'm actually like, I know what I've stored and then I can sort of go out and be in a little bit freer of a relationship, you know, in terms of like the residue I leave and what I take up from the environment and kind of that feedback loop, that mercury feedback loop. And so the whole of the year is really an invitation around that. I mean, definitely amplified in the eclipse seasons, you know, in April, May, and then in the fall, I think October, November. I'm terrible with dates, which is why I wrote this book. And then I can just flip to the page and remember the, the date. Um, but I think the, you know, for certainly around the eclipse, um, 
eclipse cycle is going to be amplified. But, you know, really just sort of remembering that as an overlay for the entirety of the year and looking at that relationship between what have I swallowed? What have I eaten for metaphorical dinner? You know, and looking at that and then being able to go out into the world and like snack on things again without, you know, like with some discernment and being that kind of sieve, that mercury sieve for sure. What you just said, it's making me so emotional because the second half of 2021 has been so devoted to my health. And it was this, I turned 32 in June, right? So it was like my own personal Herophant year of 32 oh, wow. in the first half. And, you know, I had in 2021, I had five seizures within like, within six months seven months and four within five ever since like my birthday happened and all the brain scans and everything that I navigated through they're like oh well they're not seizures well I'm having like convulsions on the floor and all these things and my mentor uh, Nisha Rodrigo who's like one of the most sought out eastern medicine practitioners in the world she was like it's your gut and so the fact that you're talking about the Herathon and the gut and Taurus and absorbing everything and seeing and doing yeah. that reevaluating. That's what I spent the whole second half of 2021 healing, clearing, alchemizing to prepare for a 222 2022 lovers Gemini. So you sharing that was just like more confirmation yeah. of how astrology and modern mysticism and these ancient wisdoms have been the deeper realization or the deeper part of my healing that Western medicine hasn't really been able to pinpoint like in the 3D world and recognizing that the healing and the journey that I've been on um, has been more of a multidimensional experience. So thank you for sharing that because it's just yeah. like more confirmation of like, yeah, I really feel like I've really gotten to the bottom of what it was and having so much trauma between the ages of 16 and 22 that I had um, when the solar plexus, which is so much of like the gut and that whole that whole space in my energetic system to prepare me, I have to clear that that and that's the other thing too. We have to clear that that sludge and that gunk out if we want to live in that open heart space again, which is the lovers. So yeah. again, I really appreciate you sharing your wisdom with that because it's just more confirmation of, again, like that one degree Virgo moon, like I know I'm on track and it may be very hard for, for some people to understand, but I know like mm -hmm. this is where God is leading me to even have and be able to have this exchange and this conversation to someone who may be listening to this and be like, Maybe I do need to check on my gut health since in Chinese, you know, medicine, the gut is associated with the brain. And from that space, releasing the anxiety and the fear of the future. And again, like you said, hollowing out that vessel so that we can trust what's coming through and being in that true union with the planet, being in that true union yeah. with humanity and God and, you know, what makes us and, 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 and self really. Yeah. Uh, so I really appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. And I think it's, I mean, it's interesting, not that this is like a little workshop of, you know, astrology workshop for your birth chart, but I think, you know, we were earlier, we were speaking about the moon sign and kind of ancestral and attending to the inner life and all of that. And I think it could be interesting to really potentially play in 2022 with your Mercury sign and sort of putting that pride of place. Because for me, it's like, it's interesting. A lot of times you hear Mercury talked about as like communication and the intellect and the exchange of ideas and all of these things that sort of place it in a very airy realm. But I think we have to also remember that it's the dual ruler of, you know, both Gemini and Virgo and Virgo mm -hmm. is a very earthy energy. And so for me, Mercury has always been sort of the metaphorical metabolizer of the chart it's how we absorb you know from our experiences and part of that process is like when we learn something and then we communicate it outward but that happens on all sorts of levels that are not intellectual as well as we're sort of taking things into our physical bodies and running them through and we all absorb it in different ways you know somebody who has a virgo moon like yourself you know there's 
there's a different kind of subtlety of layering and a little, you know, little tendrils are up and you're catching a lot versus somebody with, you know, a very, you know, a fiery moon might be just shooting it out the back of their body and it seemingly is gone. And so the process of excavating, if you're someone who metabolizes things very quickly or sort of tosses them out the other end in 2022 might be that you have to kind of like, or you're being invited to slow down a little bit and look at sort of the, that layering. And if you're someone who's like, you know, Pisces moon, Virgo moon, catching all the material, it's like, you know, we got to figure out how to like pick what's most vital for you. And then kind of, you know, let the rest pass out of the system and look at that process. So, you know, it could be fun to sort of play with your Mercury sign too, um, and looking at, um, you know, and your moon sign alongside your moon sign and looking at like, what does it mean to absorb for you? Are you somebody who has an experience and then things burn off very quickly? Are you somebody who's like, oh my God, I can't believe I've stored this, you know, box under my bed of this notion for 50 years and it's still here. Like, and looking at that process of how we metabolize experience during the coming year as well. Mind blown. Absolutely incredible. Yeah. Cause personally, my Mercury is in Taurus. So that's oh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. So you're picking up a lot and you're storing it very deeply. Yeah. It's yeah. It's, and that's well. and that's been a huge piece that has caused a lot of anxiety and things that I've needed to constantly uh feel comfortable to trust and let go. Um and so again, I think it's just really it's really important if you can start to dive in deeper and have a deeper understanding of these planets especially like you said like we we talked about like 2022 is going to be the lovers or gemini and then so understanding mercury in that sense like if you can even go forth like even beyond 2022 and start understanding the different um and working with with tarot and the journey of the major arcana in that sense and understanding the numbers and being able to understand like what planet rules that sign that's associated with that numerology I don't know I just think it's a really fun and uh, a really exciting way to understand the interconnectivity and the uh, the understanding and the and the weaving really of mysticism in our everyday life and again to also not have it feel like you have it has power over you but I think the bigger thing is like if you have this awareness of this is the energy at play with that awareness how can I outsmart it in a way especially feeling like reclaiming your power back of like okay cool if this is what I'm going to navigate through like for instance perfect example everyone there's been such a weird stigma around mercury retrograde when that's actually such a great time to be able to dive in deeper it's such a great time to be able to reevaluate and to reassess and a time for you to reclaim your power back so that's the thing that i like to teach about people especially like growing up in a culture where there's been especially like a very strong catholic family and there's been so much like stigma or like ridiculous conditioning and fear around these tools when I'm like cool I still work with Jesus through these tools and like I every time I pray over my tarot deck I ask Jesus to send me a message through tarot so that's a way that I'm working uh with my like my upbringing of how I was raised plus with something that has been a tool that's really helped me and not shaming myself because that's been part of the dismantling as well that I've done um with my upbringing and my spiritual self and my spiritual connection um so I think if we can again understand like hey if these are the energies at play like how can I be in my sovereign embodiment to see what's going on and rise above it or work with it with compassion, with love, with intention, and really just be that sacred vessel to live out and to my sole mission to help revolutionize the world with that love, with that unity, with that compassion, and with that peace. Yeah. And with, you know, with astrology and tarot, it doesn't need to be, I know these are, com you know, complex systems, but it doesn't always need to be that complicated either. Mm -hmm. Like I love playing with astrology and tarot alongside one another. And like, even if you're a total newbie, you know, if you look at the major arcana, like you're saying, each of these cards has a planetary association or a sign association, you can just start to like, see what sparks for you. You know, you have your moon in Virgo, you pull out the high priestess, which is ruled by the moon and you pull out the hermit card, which is ruled by Virgo. 
and you just look at them together and you're like, hmm, you know, like what's sparking, like really kind of playing with or even rolling it back even from there and saying, okay, my sun, moon rising, what elements are represented there? How do I connect to those elements? What elements are not there? How can I reach out to those? And, you know, that this becomes like a recovery of something that's very innate, you know, very sort of just a natural, a natural way of being. And it's not that you have to spend, you know, 50 hours on the internet or take some big complicated astrology course or whatever, you know, I mean, if you want to, certainly, yeah. And like, come work with me, work with Sabrina, like, of course, like, but it doesn't need to, you know, we can really start simply and we can start in the language that we already speak. Like you're saying, like these don't have to be, Jesus can be a part of it, whatever the language that's, you know, a part of how you speak to the unseen world or something bigger than yourself that's partnering with yourself is the language that it's meant to come through in. And there's a reason these are archetypes. It's because they speak to universalized human experience that has happened across time, across space, that has synchronistically, you know, appeared these archetypes across cultures that had no, you know, literal communication with one another. And so you speak them too. They're inside of you already. I love that. That's super beautiful. And yeah, and like I said, I feel like that's my been my journey of healing ancestrally, any upbringing or whatever stigmas or whatever. And like I said, my 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 grandmother's sister, she was a witch, a priestess who really understood and was very like, I don't know about you, but like Christmas Eve and my family is like we would always you would do you do this prayer in Italian where you say this prayer only aloud on Christmas Eve. You have holy water and olive oil, and depending on how it's like called malocchio, which is to understand the evil. Yeah. And then depending on how the oil spots are shaped or whatever, it can say, can show if someone has put like a curse on you or if there's been something and you burn it with a match and you do it three times to continue to clear out like shit like that. That's what I grew up with when I was a little kid. And I was like, Oh my God, like this is amazing. <laughs> like you growing up yeah. with, like reading astrology. And that's what I'm talking about before. Like understanding these pieces, releasing the negative stigmas that could be brought down from your culture, from uh, your religious upbringing, from your ancestral lineage. And like, showing up with and infusing it with love and with purpose and with pure intention. I think that's the way that we're going to really help heal our lineage and to really help pave the path for, for the work that's to come. And that's been, that's been my driving force for the last, you know, nine plus years of embarking on my spiritual journey back in 2012 was like, I needed to heal my family. And that to me was healing myself, my relationship with my family, clearing out ancestral debris and to also pave the path for when I have children that like they don't have to have these stigmas and I just think it's like it's been a really beautiful time like I said 2012 2020 like everything resetting reevaluating and answering the call in a way that we can make these tools and these modalities simplified and like you said not as complex and I think we're we're completely and we're constantly dismantling the stigmas and the fear around that so I really appreciate you sharing and bringing more of an awareness with these archetypes and with you know simplifying astrology and breaking it down in a way that's tangible and really in the now like you said like infusing the emotions of your inner landscape and how the external landscape loves you back and I just I really appreciate that that's your your driving force behind your medicine and the work you're really called to be sharing right now. Yeah, and I think this, this question of sovereignty is such a, I mean, this word is just so, it's so alive and like textual and juicy. Um, and it's like, when we look at things like, you know, you referenced Mercury retrograde, which I really appreciate. Cause I think we're, I think we're slowly moving out of that space where these, you know, there's kind of these fear-based um, understandings of certain transits or certain experiences. And like, I don't know, with retrogrades, I'm always like, you know, like the outer planets spend about half the year retrograde. Mercury's, you know, stations retrograde and it is not in, you know, in uh, forward motion or apparent forward motion for much of the year. Like if these things were malevolent forces, like all of life would just be this terror, you know, like it, it can't, it can't exist that way. At the same time as I think a lot of people, or there's this residue of a way of being where it's like, well, if I give the control to that, if I say like Mercury retrograde or this person or whatever the thing is, if I outsource it, 
somehow it's going to be easier because I'll just sort of crouch over here. I won't have to sort of step up into the work and it'll just be done. It'll be done to me. Something will be done to me. But we don't really want that as souls. Maybe part of our ego sometimes thinks that we want that, but we want to fly. We want we want more participation. And that, that call that you're talking about to sovereignty is like, that stepping out of that fear-based, it's like there's some discomfort around that too because part of us thinks that we want like, oh, I'm going to get the tarot reading and they're going to tell me when I'm going to meet my lover and this is going to happen and all of these kinds of event-based things. But the more that we excavate the interior, the less we have to wait for the event to wake us up to the thing, the more we just sort of move into whatever experiences we encounter and constellate experiences that are more in alignment with what's being excavated in the internal. But it's a responsibility too. And I love what you're talking about in terms of the shift from the fear base as a shift into sovereignty, which is a sovereign responsibility as well. It's a self-sufficiency that's also infused with soul, you know? So it's not purely, it's a hybrid of like an ego, you know, what I can do of myself and also a partnering with these larger currents. So cool. I love, I love that, that. You totally read my mind because now I was going to s- close out this conversation with my lightning round questions. And my first question is, what does sovereignty Oof. mean to you? And that oh. was amazing. <laughs> I think that's it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that was amazing. Yeah. And I, I, like I said, I'm just, I'm great. Like when I heard, like, I got to call this, you know, first it was a Sovereign Goddess podcast, but then I wanted to bring more inclusion of you know, non-binary and men in here as well. So we can have all voices really heard. I was like, I'm going to change it to the Sovereign Society. But what you just shared is exactly the driving force of helping people reclaim their power. So, and the why I do this work. So again, thank you for sharing that. That was so beautiful. Um, But to continue forth with the lightning round questions, what would you say to younger (laughs) Bess? Oh, baby best. Just keep on, keep on, keep the glow glowing, keep doing your weird astrology podcasts in the closet with your tape recorder, you know? Um, yeah. And I think, I think I would say to baby best, like the intensity is not a problem. Like you can embrace the intensity earlier on. I think I went through a lot of journey in my young years with um, a supercharge around things that I had to I had to sort of experience by bumping up against events in the world that were very dramatic that had to sort of wake me up to things. And I think I would tell baby best that the intensity lives inside and it doesn't need to always be sort of met through these, um, or sort of constellated through these external experiences and that you can hold it. You're able to hold it all. It's not gonna like blow out your circuits basically. I think that's what I'd say. And I'd say um, just, well, I don't think I'd need to say this because I started wearing lipstick every day in my life at a very early age, but I'd say just like, keep on with the lipstick. It's going to really moor you and anchor you <laughs> over time. Way to honor yeah. your brand, Bess. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What mm. concert would you say was one that really shifted and revolutionized like your life? Huh. Wow. That's a really good question. The first thing that's coming to my mind is, I don't even know what year this was, but it was Roisin Murphy, um, the Irish, British, like pop, dance, electronica queen, at least in my mind. And seeing like the completeness of the spectacle of her, like everything was part of it. It was like every set piece, every, you know, piece of of costuming, the whole thing. And to see that sort of integrity of performance, I just fucking love her so much. So yeah, probably that one. I love that answer. That's amazing. What book would you say was the one that like really was, has been one of the most impactful books? Well, I would have to say that the author Roberto Bolaño probably is the one that has sort of changed my life. Not maybe not changed my life, but just like partnered with the currents of my life the most. Um, He's a Chilean, but uh, spent most of his life in Mexico in Mexico city. Um, author of fiction books uh, and poetry. Um, He's deceased now, but all of his books I've just like read on a loop for um, probably the past 10 plus years. Um, And I think his books have really, he's like a very deep Taurus Scorpio character. And I think his books have really, what I love about them is that they're really encompass the full, like dense, deep human range of like behavior but they're not cynical at all they're like very much on the side of life like he can be talking about these very you know dark matter or you know pretty like matter that's infused with levity and all of it gets to be part of it in a way that still is like life is worth it it's worth it to be here and so I love this book so much I love that 
Where can we find more of you? More of me? Uh, well, I'm the, I think I'm the only person named Bess Matassa, at least that I've discovered so far. So if you just Google me, you know, you can come to my website and find out um, different offerings I have. I work one-on-one -on -one with people uh, for astrology and tarot readings and also for mentorship. If you're looking to sort of use these modalities in different ways in your own life and and learn about them. Um, I also love to collaborate with people who are makers of other kinds that want to use astrology to kind of infuse it in their practice. Uh, and and I'm ever every once in a while I pop onto Instagram. I'm like a sort of a gen, I'm a very like old tech Gen X kind of like I'm working it out. I'm working it out. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I would say mostly connecting through um, through my website. And uh, yeah, if you're in New York, you can spot me moving through the streets. I like to walk the streets a lot in many different neighborhoods and boroughs. So if you ever see me with my pink lipstick out and about, um, definitely say hi. Uh, yeah. And I think that's about it. Oh, and on my podcast, um, I do an astrology and tarot and hypnosis podcast with uh, fellow astrologer Sandy Citron. It's, mm. It now runs monthly on the first of each month. And they're kind of like mini workshops. So we take a theme that's inspired by the season each month, like, you know, resilience and Capricorn season. And then we look at different tools that you can play with um, from your chart, from the tarot deck to approach that theme. Um, and so it's like this both like a self-contained little workshop um, and also uh, for a range of, of knowledge levels in astrology and tarot and also a journey like through the year. So you can listen to them at any time. There's a whole backlog of episodes so you can dive into those if that sounds fun to you. Awesome. And if you want to hear, I had an episode, Sandy Citron was one of my first guests. So I'll have her, I'll have her uh, podcast episode linked as well in the show notes, as well as the link for the Numinous Cosmic Gear, right? Well, your book. So yeah. I'll have that link as well. Um, but to close out, is there any last little nugget of wisdom or piece of advice you want to share to whoever's listening? Hmm, man, <laughs> it's a tall order. Um, I'd say that just the, the remembrance that these languages and these modalities are innate and that you also can play with them in a way that's unscripted, you know, learning more and more about these archetypes and liberating yourself to be able to kind of pick and choose among them, you know, as you would like a, you know, a sort of wardrobe or a color palette to say, what do I need in my life today? You know, do I need a little Gemini? Do I need a little bit of Taurus? And being able to really choose these archetypes and step into the skin of them even beyond um, the sort of structure of the birth chart is something that I'd offer up to listeners. AKA you have every right to embody all the archetypes, whether or yes. not those planets are not, <laughs> you don't have planets in that part of your chart. Thank yeah. you again, Bess. This was such an amazing conversation. I really appreciate it. Congrats on your fourth book. And I'm definitely going to play it. The Astro Deck is one of my favorites. It's just so fun and beautifully made. And again, such an honor to have you here and sharing your nuggets of wisdom. And I really appreciate it. Thanks for thanks for having me, Sabrina. And I can't wait to read your book as well. Thank you. And thanks everyone for tuning in. And we'll be sharing more with you soon. Take care. <laughs>